welcome to this York Festival of Ideas events. I'm Susan Stepney and I'm going to be chairing our conversation today. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Susanna Vedlich studied biology and political science in Munich. She's worked as a writer in Boston and in Singapore. And she's a freelance science journalist for Der Spiegel, for National Geographic and for Spectrum der Wissenschaft. We're delighted to welcome Susanna to this event. She's going to chat with me today about her latest book, Slime and Natural History. We're going to talk about her research and fascinating insights into slime. Welcome, Sus Susanna. Um, so you, your book is about slime, or as it's sometimes called mucus, and you say it's a biological hydrogel. Can you just explain what that means so we know what we're actually talking about? Yes, I can do that. Um, let me just say a few words before we get started. Um, first of all, many thanks to the organizers of the festival. I'm in Singapore right now, so we have quite a few uh, time zones between us. And they've been just so helpful, and it's great that they've made it possible for me to take part. Thanks, Susan, for chairing the event. I think, honestly, we should start a band or something, because the Susans and the Sly Melts is <laughs> it's too good to waste it. And thanks also to the audience, of course. Um, thanks for joining in. You might not know it, but... It seems you're rather brave as far as audiences go, because in the last two and a half years or so since the book came out, I've met quite a few people um, who openly refuse to engage with the topic and uh, refuse to crack open the book because they find it so disgusting, the topic, not even the book. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Um, the biological hydrogel, exactly. Um, that's, uh, that's a complicated word for a simple substance that we all think we know, slime, of course. The problem is, that there is no real definition for slime. And uh, slime mainly, I think, is a sensory experience. We know slime when we see it, when we're unlucky enough uh, to touch it or maybe even hear it. Um, but that covers a huge variety of substances, toy slimes, for example, um, which I wouldn't even count as real uh, slimes, right? Um, but there are also slimes that are just a product of, of decay. So that's the way of all entropy, I guess, uh, if a solid body rots, it doesn't dissolve right away, but there are slimy faces in between. So that's a slime, but the slime doesn't have a function. It's just, uh, it just happens. Uh, and the slimes that I'm interested in are biological slimes. It means that microbes, plants, animals, humans, uh, whoever produces them in order that they fulfill some functions, important functions. We all need slimes, every single organism and need slimes. And the fascinating thing for me is uh, that I only found out over the years that we researched the topic that all these slimes, microbial slimes, just as our mucus, are similar enough as a substance. The hydrogels, biological hydrogels, that means they're similar in their structure, which means they often have uh, show the same behavior, a similar behavior. And I would all group them into that group of substances, uh, the hydrogels. Okay, well, um, that, that, that's great. Um, you mentioned that people don't engage with slime very much, and that's, it's got this ick factor, hasn't it? It's gross, it's disgusting, and so on. So how did you get interested in slime, given that? I mean, I wasn't into slime, obviously. <laughs> I found it gross, and I still find it gross. Um, but I read an article, I think, 20 years or so ago about snail slime, just ordinary snail tricks that we all know because we see the garden or somewhere. And they look just like it's, it's garbage, right? It can't, it can't be worth anything. Um, and in that article, um, I learned for the first time that snails and other animals as well communicate via the slimes. So, for example, a male snail, at least with some species, will find a female via her old slime trail. They can read the slime. There are lots of messages in there, like what species is she, is she male? Is she female? Um, which direction did she go? Is she attractive? Meaning well-rounded, no parasites. Um, and there are also predatory snails that will find their prey via the slime trails. And that simply stuck with me over the years, many, many, many years. And I always thought there must be more interesting uh, slime uh, out there, uh, but yeah, it took me 20 years to get there. <laughs> okay, 20 years to overcome some of the ick factor. But why do you think there is an ick factor? Why do you think slime is disgusting to us, sort of viscerally? Yeah, you know, um, disgust is 
really fascinating emotion that I think at least from a biological perspective is supposed to keep us away from, uh, from pathogens. Uh, so the, the best pathogen obviously is the one that we don't even encounter. So if we're disgusted by something, we don't touch it, we don't get infected. But the problem is that we can't see microbes. You will, yeah, like coronaviruses, they might be here, but you just don't see them, you can't hear them. Uh, so we react to phenomena like bad smells or slime that are often associated with, with microbes and with pathogens. And I think that at least in the industrialized world, slime is so removed from our world. We don't care for our sick here and we don't have garbage rotting in the street um, that our disgust can't, is just limitless. You know, there's no reality check. We don't have to engage with it. And that's why slime is such a huge, huge, huge egg factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, uh, yes, okay. Um, I, I don't feel so bad about being icked by slime, but are, are, are there any good slimes? Are there any slimes that we do actually engage with and don't think of them as, as slime? What, what about something like honey or things like that? Do they count? Um, honey, I wouldn't even say that honey is a slime um, because like we said, the hydrogels, mm -hmm. the, the main characteristic is that they are just, uh, they mostly consist of water, more, way more than 90%. Um, it's just that um, they show an unusual behavior depending on what mechanical force works on them. And that's a bit similar to, uh, to honey, to ketchup, substances like that. Um, they're really tricky in like the ketchup, you know, you want to get it out of the bottle, it doesn't work and you hit it and then uh, everything comes out at once. Uh, and that's a bit like slime. So the behavior is similar, it's unusual behavior. But I wouldn't say that honey uh, is, a, is a slime, though you can react to it. It's just a, a dripping, you know, <laughs> and it's, that slow fluid that's always a bit suspicious. That's true. Yeah. But, but we have a, a slightly different um, uh, feeling about honey as, as a way of getting around some of the ick factor. We, we do at least uh, think honey is nice. what it is. I, I'm not sure if, if there was a bit of honey uh, on your desk and you didn't know what it was, it would be super super gross right yes 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 probably and the more you know what honey is and, and how bees actually produce it it does become <laughs> gross again <laughs> yes okay one of the things i was fascinated about when i was reading your book is is the fact that different slimes um although you call them all the same thing they can be anything from quite runny and a lubricant for the snails to slide along all the way up to incredibly strong glues and um and in fact sort of as an armor um what um what kind of range of behaviors have they got and how how do they have those different behaviors it has a lot to do uh, with how much water is in there so for example we have mucus in our body that has to change its behavior like uh, in the female cycle sometimes it has to be very compact and sticky so that no pathogens uh, can enter the body uh, at other times during the fertile days, of course, sperm has potentially to get through. Um, and this is basically the same slime that goes from very solid and sticky to very runny. Um, so I think it depends on, on the environment. The pH factor, for example, is important. That can change how much water a slime takes in and that it becomes more porous or it's really, really sticky. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it's, and it's fascinating because slimes are mostly water. It's just stiff water and <laughs> that incredible range of behavior. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yes, I was I was amazed by the um, the, the glue aspect when uh, when I was reading your book um, about the um, um, the little shellfish that stick themselves uh, onto things like barnacles and, and so on. I, I before I read the book, I'd kind of imagined that that was a sort of like like a like a sucker, uh, like a vacuum. But you, you say it's a glue um, and, and an incredibly strong glue. Um, is there anything we can learn from this um, biological glue? Yeah, we are trying. <laughs> we are trying really hard at the moment. Um, the, the, that's, that's a limpet um, that you mentioned, and probably everyone has seen it uh, on rocky coasts. Um, if you just want to see what's underneath, you can forget it because you can't pry them off the rock. They will stick so hard. Um, and I think uh, scientists tried for a century to find out what it is, and everyone thought it must be like the super kind of muscle or special kind of contraction. But I think two years ago, so they found out that it's actually just a slime. It's a sticky slime, a biological glue. Um, and all, basically all marine animals, um, or at least invertebrates, 
um, produce glues that are much better than ours. I mean, our world is full of glues, the shoes, furniture, books, everything is glued, of course. Um, but our synthetic glues, um, they're often rather toxic uh, and they don't stick if they get wet. We all know that the, the band-aids did rub off the second you step into a shower. And every simple uh, marine slug can do better than that. So scientists are really busy at the moment trying to analyze what's in those biological clues uh, and to see if they can somehow imitate it because uh, we could use that for wounds, right? It's much more elegant if you can glue uh, a wound closed after surgery um, instead of uh, with the needle. I mean, that's just, that's just clumsy, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, these um, animals have had millions of years <laughs> to perfect the clues, uh, but yeah, we we'd like uh, to have them. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So that so that's glue for the very sticky end, and then um, clearly there are other things again. Um, so what about the lubricant side? Are we using the idea of the lubricants um, to get to get better oils or other lubricants ourselves? Uh, it's possible. I, they haven't read anything about it, but it's, it's possible, of course. Uh, but there's another field, in a sense, um, where scientists try uh, to produce uh, artificial mucus. Because, of course, we need mucus as a glue. Every single bite has to <laughs> um, migrate through our whole body uh, and shouldn't you know, hurt the tissue or get stuck. And that's thanks to mucus. And um, the problem is that for whatever reason, is it the Western diet or some other reason, um, often our mucus barriers are becoming too thin and damaged. That can give uh, inflammations, all kinds of problems. Uh, and of course, it would be great if we could just, you know, swallow some artificial mucus that would heal those damages. Uh, or for example, um, in pregnancy, it's important uh, for, that women have really well-functioning uh, mucus plugs so that no pathogens can infect um, uh, uh, the baby. Uh, and that's often a problem. So if you could use artificial mucus again uh, to remedy that, that would be just, just perfect, you know? So again, if, we, if we're starting to um, develop artificial mucus uh, for a variety of uh, needs ourselves, we're going to have to overcome the ick factor somehow. Um, do, is, is that just going to be a marketing ploy or do you think uh, that there are other things that we can do? I think uh, we just need to engage with slime. I mean, I still wouldn't want to, to touch a, a, a slime. I don't know uh, what it is or where it came from. And I wouldn't touch slimy animals or at least not the slimy parts of slimy animals. Uh, so it's good to be cautious. Uh, but if you read about slime and know how sophisticated it is and that we all need it. I mean, we would literally fall apart without our hydrogels. Um, infections wouldn't be a problem because we'd be dead uh, without our hydrogels before any pathogen had the chance to infect us. I think the appreciation comes with the knowledge how fascinating that stuff is. So what's your favorite thing that slime does? Yeah, uh, I've cycled through phases. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started, of course, with the magazine article, to, uh, just to, it was mind blowing to, uh, to read that there are animals that communicate via slime uh, and that they have these detailed messages. You know? uh, and then came um, maybe the, the lubrication side, how snails crawl. I mean, one scientist in the 80s who uh, found out how snails actually uh, move on slime um, posed his research question as how do animals with one foot crawl on glue and they they do it because they apply different kinds of pressures and then it's the, the slime sometimes it's harder and then softer and then they can glide on it and then of course there's like we talked about the, the mucus as a as a barrier like in our in our gut that has to keep pathogens out billions of pathogens basically every day um, at the same time accommodate the microbes uh, we need and we want to live there and also to let nutrients in that's really, really sophisticated uh, for material that's stiff water, like I said. And then the, the glue stuff is great. And now I think I'm back to um, the messages because it's coming up again and again. Slime molds do it, um, worms do it, uh, snails communicate with that. So yeah, I'm going around and around. Yeah. So, so obviously it's uh, important to research a, 
a range of these. One of the things in your book you talk about is also the microbial mats that uh, sort of glue different bacteria and so on together, so almost so they form a community and protect them and so on. And there's a lot of work on uh, antimicrobial resistance where um, you're trying to get rid of the microbes, but also trying to get rid of these mats of them. Do you, have you come across uh, anything that either that or something similar that, that we're going to be able to use their own slime against them uh, in, in, in a sense? Um, yeah, that's actually a huge research. It has been for a long time um, because these, these mats, these biofilms, microbial biofilms, uh, are a big problem um, for our health. Uh, so for example, we have to brush our teeth because the plaque that we have to remove, that's a microbial biofilm. That's actually a sophisticated slime. And as advanced as we are and have our high tech stuff, we still only can get rid of it by brushing our teeth. A really, really low tech because these slimes are so amazing. Microbes have had uh, billions of years uh, before we showed up where they could develop the slime. So they're really good with that. And of course the teeth, that's a problem um, if you develop cavities, but it's uh, a much bigger problem if you have one of the microbes with the biofilms and the slimes in the body somewhere. Uh, infection um, because those slimes are like bunkers and antibiotics can't intrude and the microbes live, live happily in there uh, and you can't really reach them. So what we do now, we scientists um, uh, and doctors is uh, trying to find ways to stop the communication because they will only build the uh, biofilms once there's enough of them. So they, in a sense, count the numbers uh, and then they will start and if we can convince them by disturbing the communication that there's only a few of them, they won't do anything. And there actually has been a publication uh, come out last week, I think, that mucus does that with, with fungi um, that can cause infections, that they, like the molecules in the mucus in our mouth, in the body, keeps those fungi apart so that they don't realize um, that there are others and they could actually cause a really bad infection, a bit like maybe Sleeping Beauty. You know, they're not dead, but they don't act on their potential. Okay, so you talk about a paper that came out only a week ago, but you know, you wrote your book a while back. So you're still researching and, and reading about slime. Obviously it's a, a, a great interest. There's, there's a huge amount of research that's clearly gone into your book. Do you want to say something about the process of doing this research? Were you expecting to have to do that much research when you started the book? No, I thought it would be like a nice side project, you know, funny science, uh, 10 interesting slime animals, microbes, hagfish, uh, humans, <laughs> snails, <laughs> and stuff like that, and a bit of, of science, of course. Um, and the thing about slime is, that if you Google slime, you will only find a small part of what's out there uh, regarding biological slimes. Uh, but once you dig deeper, you will come through sideways to other slimes. And the interesting thing is, and maybe one of the reasons why there is no real slime community, um, that depending on who the organism is that produces the slime, the slime has a different name, like microbes produce biofilms. The plants produce mucilage. We have our mucus. And there are many, many, many names uh, for those uh, hydrogen. So you will never know just by seeing those names that, in essence, these substances are really, really similar and behave in a similar way. And I didn't know that when I started those. In the end, it was more than three years, I think, because there came just one thing after the other. Um, and of course, then you don't let go if a, if a story like that uh, with a substance. Then, no one really has written about that way. Um, that has always been there through the whole of evolution. We probably wouldn't be here without biological slimes. And uh, it's uh, important in the environment because there's so much slime out there and that many habitats are actually just, they look the way they do because there's a lot of slime in there. So you, you can't give up a project like that, but yeah, it exploded basically. <laughs> Yes, there's lots of rabbit holes that, 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 that happen with lots of different sorts of research, but it's, uh, it's just fascinating there. So uh, when you were involved in all that research, what was the most surprising thing that you discovered other than that there's so much slime? Uh, I think the whole uh, ecological relevance, because you don't, you don't see that, you know, um, uh, that the sea, the sea has, a, sorry to say, a skin of slime on top, that we, it's just too thin to 
to see with your eyes, but it's there. And it's incredibly important because as you probably all know, um, the ocean takes up uh, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and hopefully stores it <laughs> in, in the deep sea um, to counteract uh, climate change. And of course, every single molecule has to pass through that uh, slime layer. So now that the, the oceans are getting warmer, the microbes that produce those slimes might be happy that it's more pleasant for them. They make more slime or maybe a different slime. It's stickier or less sticky. No one really knows, but it, could be, of course, that every single exchange, like also the, the, the oxygen is produced in the ocean has to come out so that we can breathe it, um, that those passages could be slowed down, or maybe even the molecules might move faster or just different reactions with those global cycles. That's really important. That's just one area where there is slime that we don't know about. Um, there's, there's slime in the desert. Um, it's called the biocrust. It's a community of um, algae, bacteria, maybe some moss, and they are all being glued together and uh, the surface of, of the soil is uh, being glued together by slime. So if temperatures rise, maybe those slimes will dry out or those biocrusts will all die out. And you, they're hard to see. I mean, they look mm -hmm. like black crust. If you don't know what it is, you will never recognize it. Things like that, that was probably what made it like a real big story for me because I wasn't aware of that at all. And often scientists aren't aware. So if I ask them if uh, marine slimes will change now that the ocean is getting warmer and uh, more acidic, I talked to a marine biologist just two days ago and I get that a lot that they have this far away look and they say, oh, you're giving me an idea. Um, because you, yeah, you, you just don't think that way about slime. Mm. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the fact that slime covers the ocean surface, I was just completely uh, unaware of, of that. And then, as you say, the desert, we tend to think of the desert as something completely dead almost. And yet you're, we're saying it's covered with the slime, which itself is the product of life um, yeah. in, in, that particular, in that particular way. You, you break your book up, interestingly, into various sections sort of about the past, present, future and, and art and so on. So um, do you want to say something about how you think that slime contributed to the process of getting us here in the first place, the evolutionary process? Yeah, I mean, no one can really know when the first organisms uh, used slime, but it's highly likely, at least to some scientists, that probably more or less the first cells that ever existed used it because in a sense it's a cheap material and sometimes slimes just happen uh, even in the environment clay minerals for example in the right concentration in, in seawater will produce a slime and if you have biomolecules that usually get dissolved right away in the ocean they're very well protected in there so slime could have been like an incubator for life even. And uh, once there were microbes it's highly likely at least that they use slimes maybe then produced uh, slimes themselves. Um, there is one theory that uh, going from single cell organisms to us, uh, multicellular organisms, uh, slime was really important um, because that's the idea. It's like a barrier to the environment. Um, without that, you know, microbes are everywhere. We, we live in a microbial world and they can't just enter um, any organism, uh, settle there, be happy, <laughs> do whatever they want. And slime is still is um, that that barrier that's not completely cut off like our skin is, for example, uh, so that we that we've learned maybe to or our ancestors um, to accommodate microbes that are useful to us and to, to keep others out. So it's one idea um, that without slime and especially those large slime layers, um, we might not even be. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Some organisms have the slime on their outsides, and others have the slime on the insides. But we all appear to have it somewhere. Is that is that yes. what you're saying, really? Yes. Yeah. We've just hidden ours inside. Um, um, why why do you think some people think that snakes, for example, are slimy? Um, because uh, is it confusion with other ones that are slimy, like like frogs and so on? But but, but people seem to think snakes are slimy. Yeah. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting idea. I can only speculate. I think that by now, according to my experience with other people, slime is like the like the biggest disgust trigger. 
And of course, many people fear stakes or are disgusted by them. And somehow maybe that, that just comes together. Like it's the modern monsters. If you look at uh, fairy tales, old fashioned fairy tales, neither are the witches um, slobbering all over the place uh, or the dragons, they're all dry. But nowadays, Ghostbusters, aliens, stranger things, it's all slimy. You, you know immediately if there's slime, okay, the villains, the monsters on the way. Uh, that always works. And maybe that's the connection that whatever you, you don't like, it must be slimy. Okay. So you, so you mentioned um, the use of slime in films to, to indicate who the baddie is. Um, 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 what, what else? I mean, that's one of the sections in your, in your, in your book. Uh, I was expecting to find lots and lots of biology, but I was interested to find there's a whole section on slime in art. Do you want to... I've, and I've also got a question that's, that's come through from a member of the audience about the influence of slime on Art Nouveau. Do you want to mention something about that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question because a slime has two PR problems, I think. First, most people think it's just the grossest thing out there. And then we nowadays tend to think that it's, it's like it's an unformed substance. It must be garbage. But uh, it wasn't always like that. So if you go back to Art Nouveau and Ernst Haeckel and his fascinating, absolutely beautiful um, uh, illustrations of marine animals mainly, um, everyone found them so beautiful that of course even Art Nouveau took some inspiration from that. Um, and Ernst Haeckel is of course wasn't, or didn't see himself as an artist, but he was an evolutionary biologist who uh, tried to explain without God, without the Bible, where did life come from? And that's like, probably the hugest, of the, yeah, that maybe the biggest difference uh, we have to how we see slime today, that they saw only potential when they looked at slime. They, they said it's something between dead matter and life, so it must be a source of life. And he thought that um, the whole ocean floor was covered with slime, like pulsating slime that would bring forth life and, and new species um, all the time, that primeval slime. Uh, and he clung to that theory really, really, really stubbornly, even when it was proved already. Uh, it was just so tempting to think um, that slime had all this potential and it could yeah, become something else, right? And uh, we only have that nowadays, I think, in, in the horror movies where you have aliens that are just a slob blob, whatever, and then they somehow mold themselves into your neighbor, your partner, your colleague, and you never know, is this the alien or is it your colleague? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can think of where we, where we use or play with the potential of slime. So um, I've got a question in the, in the Q&A here about saying that uh, Brian Cox said on one of his TV programs that if there's life on other planets, it will be slime. Um, I don't know whether he said it will be sort of only slime or, or there'll have to be slime there. So uh, do, do you agree that um, a, alien life will probably also have a slime component to it? Uh, I'm probably not qualified to say if it's, if it's really likely, but I talked to a, a NASA astrobiologist for the book and he said it's more, it's like a question of probability. So if aliens had ever come to Earth, and uh, looked for life, they would have found in all likelihood microbial life because there were billions and billions of years of only microbes, slimy microbes, very slimy microbes. And uh, we're just the newcomers, right? So if you think about um, life on other planets, it's probably more likely that it will be something akin to microbes, small organisms, maybe just single cells or whatever it is. Um, uh, and slime, since it's only water, you need water to have life. So water would be there. And if you can bind that water, it will protect you and you can store stuff in there. You can defend yourself. So it's just, if there's life, it's highly likely. I think so, yeah. Slime. So slime slime is ubiquitous. That's uh, yeah. it's what we should be looking for when we, when we go. But, yeah. So um, all these sections in the book, each, each one I felt could almost be an entire book in itself. And in fact, each section is um, broken down into a series of relatively short chapters. Each one of those chapters I felt could be a book in itself. Um, um, uh, I, I started off thinking I'd like to read, 
I'd like to read a book on every chapter, but then I decided that would be too much slime and I'd like to read a book on any chapter. So, but any one of those chapters I think could be expanded into a book. So do you feel that there was, you know, you had to do an awful lot of research for this. Um, was there anything that you regret that you had to leave out of the book because there just wasn't enough room? Um, not in the German book that came out in 2019. I was very comfortable that, of course, always in broad strokes, but still I had everything in there. And then a year later, a bit more than a year later, I worked on the English translation. Already I had to revise it in some chapters because so much is happening in research. And I think that now there basically every day there are new stories on slime, even if it's not explicitly on slime, but there's some slime <laughs> in there. Um, I think now it would be impossible to take everything in. That's just too much. And there's so much happening. When, when I started out to, in the research, I wasn't even sure if what I would call those different slimes, if they were similar enough to, to call them one type of substance, because there were no, no overviews written or stuff like that. And that came during the research. So the timing was perfect, just pure luck on my side, of course. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it. Um, and now there are lots and lots of, uh, of publications where scientists take like a broader view. And uh, of course, it's, it's good that uh, I wasn't wrong there, but it would be hard to, to describe everything that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said you, you wrote it originally in German. Did you, did you do the translation yourself or did you work with a translator no. or what? No, no, it's been translated. Great translation only. Of course, uh, worked at it to see if there were any uh, mistakes, and then the, the new stuff. <laughs> the, new stuff right? the German uh, version had uh, in some chapters. Okay, scientists are trying to do that. Maybe in the future, eventually. And then a year later, it was like, okay, here it is. So, uh, of course, you want to have um, you, know, you want to have those updates. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's the, the 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 problem of trying to keep everything um, everything up to date. Um, um, there's an interesting question here. We talked about the ick factor of slime, but somebody's asking the question, is it, the, is it does the word itself, the, the shape of the word, do you feel, have also have an ick factor? There are some words um, that just sort of, because it's slime, maybe, that that feels like that. Um, what, what's, the, what's the German for slime? Slime. It's slime, slime, okay. <laughs> Uh, and I think actually, which is fascinating, uh, a Russian guy told me in Russian it's sleaze. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so he, yes, you can yeah you, you can feel the slime in saying the word, but um, I'd say from a modern perspective, yes, could be that just the sound of it. But then um, not so long ago, people heard slime or slime and thought, oh great, that's like a promising substance. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> must be a modern feeling. So someone's asking, asking also in the chat. Uh, we've been talking about slime as this, but what um, what's a slime mold? Because it's it's not just slime; it's an actual living creature. So what what is a slime mold? Um, there are actually two different types, but the one that gets all the attention now because it has this liquid brain like <laughs> ability um, is slime mold like uh, fusarum, where you have lots of uh, cell nucleus inside. It's like a, a giant cell, a really giant cell. It can cover uh, a large area with uh, lots of nuclei inside. And it makes smart decisions. And of course, that's why it forces us um, to think or rethink how we define intelligence. Because intelligence for us usually means you have a brain, you have like this uh, center where all the decisions uh, are being made. And that slime mold obviously doesn't have any neurons, no brain, nothing like that, and still find shortest ways to wherever the food is, for example. And uh, people are trying to find out how it works. You would know that better than me, uh, that they see it as some sort of computer algorithm or similar in the decision making. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, but... I think the, the name slime mold has to do with, it, it looks like flowing slime, but it leaves slime. That's again, the communication, which I find so fascinating um, that slime molds also use the slimes as a external memory. Uh, so when they, they spread out to see if they can find food and if there's no food, they will just pull back. And you can see, um, even this, it looks like a ghostly tree, that uh, silhouette, like a slime mold silhouette in slime that dries out, but 
uh, whenever this, the slime mold comes back and finds its old uh, slime trails, you would know, don't go there, like no to myself, it's not worth it and will pass by. And that's, again, really sophisticated for a, a organism without a single brain cell. <laughs> Literally without a single brain cell, or or all it is is a single brain cell. Well, yes, <laughs> yes. That's, um, there's another interesting question in the in the in the Q and A about the about toy slime. Um, I'm saying that that there's a toy for children that that actually is slime, and and they're kind of playing with it. Parents are also um, using the same slime to sort of clean dust out of uh, hard to get at places and so on. Um, and and and, they, and the, the the person also says it can be a good stress reliever to play with. I, I'm interested in hearing that. I've I've not done that myself. Um, so, how many more are marketing opportunities do you think there are for bringing slime into the home in a positive way? Just to to play with or um, to relax with. I think that will be will probably stay a kid's thing, or maybe. Yeah, like you said, uh, that uh, relaxation aspect um, for, for adults as well. Um, but other than that, how, how, of course, we use already hydrogels. We use slime. You know, you have those anti wrinkle hydrogels that are really anti wrinkle slimes. I mean, we're putting all those slimes in our face. No one would call it slime because then uh, no one would buy it or use it. But the slimes are already here. And even we eat them, for example, it's usually like the traditional. Uh, dishes that are very often rather slimy um, because you have to grow up with it. That's that's another fascinating thing about disgust that, of course, we are all, we are born with the ability to be disgusted, but we only learn as kids what it is that we should be um, feel disgusted about. So if you grow up with certain dishes, gloopy as they may be, it's all fine because you haven't yet learned um, to, uh, yeah, to despise them. And that's often a problem if you go abroad and then are confronted with <laughs> stuff that people eat there. Um, it can be really hard um, to get used to that or impossible because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just gross, but that goes all the ways, of course. So we, we, we each culture has its own gloopy food which it can eat, but nobody else can. Is that what, yeah. kind of what you're saying? Yes. So. Yeah, in, in Japan, for example, um, one dish is that I've tried is called, I probably pronounce it uh, not in the correct way, natto beans. That these are fermented beans, uh, very healthy, and they actually only taste a bit like um, coffee. So not bad at all. But if you pull them out because microbes have fermented them, it's like those strings of slime, long, really, really stringy slime with those beans baked in the slime and it's so hard to try them if, if not it used to it i mean it doesn't smell bad it doesn't taste bad but it's just seeing slime and i think i'm somewhat hardened <laughs> comes to slime but of course food is always a uh, different that's one yeah. well i like the idea that that, that that most cosmetics seem to be slime as well and that's um yes so yeah, it's so hydrating you know so it's a combination of marketing and familiarity um don't call it slime and have known that it have known about it all your life and you'll be happy with it but yeah, big promises of course because um i think it's more in asia than somewhere else um that uh, people already have uh, snails crawling over their faces <laughs> sorry <laughs> you just need to tell them that it'll look better afterwards and then probably the slime isn't this big okay. some people will do anything won't they yes <laughs> That's uh, that's that, that's amazing and, and, and slightly disgusting. Yes, <laughs> I see what I see what you mean. Uh, I didn't really get too much ick factor from um, from the, reading the book, but um, um, from from listening to some of the examples. Yes, that that's uh, that, that's quite amazing. Um, okay, I'm just having a quick look. Um, um, so there's a question about any more uses of artificial mucus uh, in in medicine. Um, that, 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 that we have. I mean, if we, I mean, cosmetics is sort of like one end of the spectrum. Um, and, and then you talked about um, gluing wounds together and, and yeah. potentially also making digestion uh, easier. Is there mm. any other um, examples that you've come across? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's actually a huge research area. For example, all, um, all research that goes into um, growing tissues in the lab. Um, 
that's what the body, that's what our um, connective tissue does. That's the matrix where the cells learn how to behave and what to become. And if you want to do that in the lab, you need that kind, you need a hydrogel, you need that kind of matrix. Uh, and I think that there are even trials where they um, take that kind of, like a hydrogel, just that's mm -hmm. based on our um, connective tissue, um, where they put some substances in there that if you put it on a wound, they will call the right cells to come here and repair the wound, stuff like that. Uh, but there are also um, trials to use hydrogels as bandages that you can put it on, again, a wound. And uh, often they can then show, for example, if you have a temperature, if there's an infection. Uh, I think they're even trying to do stuff like that. Um, they can measure uh, your uh, sugar <laughs> in the blood and stuff like that. So it's absolutely endless uh, possibilities and it's all based on hydrogels and often enough on like you try to copy or imitate um, what, what our natural hydrogels are doing. So yeah, that is a lot going on. So that's, that, I, I find that fascinating and it might, this might be getting a bit too, uh, too detailed now, but you were saying they can ca call the right cells to come around. So the hydrogel itself isn't a kind of alive in that sense. It's just, as you say, sticky water or stiff water. Yeah. Um, but it's communicating with the things that are alive. So wh when do slimes go wrong? Uh, um, um, wrong for the organism. Obviously, um, um, the microbial mats are wrong for us, but they're right for the organisms. But do we have any problems ourselves with slime going wrong? It's talking to the wrong cells or it's the wrong thickness or something? Yeah. Um, uh... Cancer, for example, is also, in a sense, a slime problem because the connective tissue, that hydrogel, is supposed to keep cells where they are supposed to be. So a liver cell isn't supposed to migrate in the body somewhere else. And we all know that cancer becomes really dangerous usually once you get um, cells in a different place of the body. And they're not supposed to, to survive there. There's always a different environment, but somehow they trick the matrix in another organ that they belong here, that they can grow here, and they somehow manage to anchor them themselves. And then, of course, you get um, secondary tumors, and, and that's the problem. So that's a misreading of, uh, okay, you're a liver cell, you're not supposed to be here. Because all the hydrogels in our bodies are barriers. So the mucus, of course, on the internal um, surfaces, but then you have like the connective tissue um, around um, the, the tissues and the organs. And that's again, trying to keep pathogens out, but also the cells inside. So uh, it's like the police trying to have <laughs> cells uh, just uh, leaving the place they're supposed to be. So, so um, again, looking at the Q and A, there's um, you talking about slimes being um, part of the ick factor is because they're due to things that are nasty, in, including things that are rotting. Now, is it that the slimes are produced by the, by the decomposition or is it that the slimes are helping the decomposition? Um, are, are we, uh, which way around does it work? I think it's both ways. Um, the first step will be that if a biological body is rotting, then the tissue breaks open, the cells break open and tissues and cells are somewhat slimy themselves. And then that comes, it's, it's not pure water. So they will really have a slimy mess. But then of course, sooner or later, microbes will settle there, produce their slimy biofilms. And so you have a very sophisticated slime on top of the just decay slime um, that's, that doesn't have any functions. Okay, so if you were, um, if you were writing this book, again, doing a second edition maybe, or, or it sounds like that the English version is almost a second edition from what you were saying. Um, is there anything that you would do differently either in the, 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 the writing of the book or, or the research for it or, or, or the structure of it or anything like that? Um, I think it was already a big step from, from the German edition to the English one because I was much more cautious that I think slimes are hydrogels and things like that because I didn't have any material to base that uh, assumption on. Uh, I'm much more confident already in the English edition and probably now I would, yeah, <laughs> propose it just, that's the way it is. Um, it's not my idea, but that's, I, I know now I can prove it that it's, that it's like that. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it was hard for me to decide how 
to shape the chapters because if you have a substance that's always been there and all organisms use it and it's in the environment and it's in art, uh, how do you define the, you know, the, the, the barriers are between the chapters? And I, I wanted it to be open. I mean, slime is not a hard, solid heap or substance or whatever. Uh, it's always moving and I wanted the chapters to be like that. So you have, for example, snails crawling through different chapters. Not like I thought in the beginning, I would do it just one chapter on snails. But I mean, it's not just one function. They, they use all of it. So it's ev everywhere. It's important that they come again and again. Mm -hmm. Or persons like Ernst Teckel, who is just fascinating, all the different slime aspects that he worked on. Uh, so it's just a really open structure. That I wanted to give the feeling that this is like a huge amount of material. And of course, I have to shape it somehow. Or it has to be a book. That, that you can read, but still have it open, um, just, yeah, like slime. So um, in, in one sense, it's slightly disappointing that there are no pictures in the book. Um, I understand that was just a, a publishing um, decision, but do you feel that there could be, a, a, you know, almost a, a complimentary book on um, pictures of slime? Absolutely. I would love to do that <laughs> from the beginning. Um, uh, I would love to do a kid's book on slime, obviously, and I would love to have I like a, a coffee table book, and like this huge slime picture, all the slimy animals. Uh, and it would be so easy to get the material. I mean, you have just to watch nature documentaries, um, like on marine life. And then you see that scene. And there's a fish coming through, and then you hear this is the so and so fish, and here's a lobster, whatever it is. And then you see slime, lo long strings of slime, and nothing will be said about it. It's like it's not there. <laughs> and now I, of course, see it. Yeah, please explain where there's, where's the slime coming from. And it's important. I mean, all marine animals need slime secreted. Um, and again, a new publication that um, uh, coral colonies use slime to become really one unit. So to distribute um, nutrients that they've taken up. Um, and they have these currents, slime currents on top. That's just a new thing. So it would be just my total pleasure to do more of that and, and to show slime. Uh, and yeah, that, that could work against the egg factor, I think, I hope. Yes, yes. I mean, beautiful pictures of, of, of creatures like that and, uh, and possibly movies as well of, of the actual things moving around. Yeah, okay. So that would be kind of a complimentary book, but um, given that that book is now written, you're obviously moving on to other things. So what's your next book going to be about? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm just toying with ideas, you know, like I said, I'm in Singapore right now for a year and that's almost uh, come to an end already. Um, so there was no time to think about books, but I'm still very interested in biological phenomena, animals, um, that we see the way we see them because we're discussing or we feel them like snakes, like parasites, uh, things like that. It's just amazing to see that this universe is, and ubiquitous substance like slime is so hidden. I mean, that's probably the most amazing thing about the book. Why aren't there 10 books on slime already? It, it's, it's, I didn't have any secret knowledge and the publications are out there. Everyone could have done it. Um, but we don't just don't see it. I have interv I had interviews who asked me um, towards the end um, and I explained that slime is everywhere. Like, do you see it now? <laughs> is it slime <laughs> somewhere around here? <laughs> it's like a, a new perspective on the world, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think obviously like parasites, it's the same. More than half of all animal species are parasites, not full parasites, maybe just one stage in their life, but still. So how can we still treat them like exceptions, they're the norm. That's like the dominant life form. Uh, and yeah, now here in the tropics, of course, that's much closer. Uh, you just go for a walk and it's poisonous vipers that you see. Um, and that gets you thinking how important these animals are and why we try not to see them. Yeah, so, so if you get um, involved in a, another book, do you expect that also to suddenly lead you down three or four years worth of rabbit holes when you suddenly discover that it's an even bigger topic? <laughs> Hopefully. I, I think, um, of course, I'm, I'm trying to think of any uh, huge story that's hidden just like slime was, but I mean, that's just 
uh, probably doesn't exist. It's just because we're so disgusted uh, by the stuff. Um, but there are, of course, important stories that haven't been fully told. So and that would be enough for me. I, I don't have uh, or I don't want to spend another three years full time uh, on a book. Yeah, that's too much. That is, that, that, that is a lot of work. But may, maybe, yes, um, I, I think you'll find that there are rabbit holes at, at, at anywhere and it is actually drawing the line, isn't it, which is which is part of the problem. Um, I'm just looking again. Um, so there's another question here which says, why are some types of fungi very slimy more so than others? I don't really know. Could be um, just like different animals, uh, maybe if they uh, grow in sunnier places, um, they need to be hydrated on the, on the outside. Um, could be something like that, but I, I don't really know. Uh, it all depends, of course, uh, how and where organisms live. Um, with slime, of course, it's always a problem since it's so highly hydrated uh, that unless you live in the water, um, you always have to be careful that it doesn't dry out. That's why we have our mucuses on the inside. Apart from the eyes, that's like the only um, slimy area that you have on the outside. And even there, there's the mucus. And then there's like a waxy layer on top, uh, a lipid layer on top, just to prevent even on that tiny area. Um, the water just to evaporate um, because the eyes would dry out otherwise. And so, and then the dry, drying out of the eyes as, as one gets older is a, is a problem there. Yes. Yeah, staring at the screen because it seems, or at least that's what I've read, that we forget to blink. Yeah. And that's really bad. <laughs> so the blinking you're saying is, is, is a way of moving slime across our eyeballs. Is that uh, yeah, exactly? Uh, yes. So I think it, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're basically saying there's so much slime everywhere, and and but we have this ick feeling about it, and yet so much of it is actually positive. Uh, there's um, so when we're reading the book, uh, most of the slime is you know essential for the function of the organism, is or is essential for a, a variety of things, and in a sense, it's only a very small number of slimes that we should be wary of. Um, so we do. It definitely does need a need a, a, a much better PR uh, in that. So I'm a fan of your picture book idea. Um, is there another way of, of sort of getting, you, you said you have to kind of grow up with it. So uh, other than just eating gloopy food, is there a way that we can introduce children to slime beyond toys? I mean, is there a way of keeping a slimy things as pets? Do you think that should, should everybody have a, a snail as a pet? Did you have snails as pets? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but don't all kids. I mean, I, I'm not sure. At least mine uh, both brought snails home and kept them somewhere hidden. And uh, poor snails, of course, didn't survive. I think that especially small kids, um, they're absolutely fascinated by, by all gloopy stuff. It's not just slime, of course, um, they like all that. Uh, and I think that at the age of six or seven, uh, it starts that they become aware of what they are supposed to be um, disgusted um, by. And then they can be really picky, especially with the food. That's when they stop eating food that they liked before. And it's all really suspicious and they want to don't want to touch anything. Uh, so we have to, to bridge that gap properly, that age gap. Right, yes, yes. I'm just uh, looking through to the, the list to see if there's any questions that I've missed or haven't been covered. And I think what um, uh, what the questions are asking, um, I think the answer to many of these questions is read the book. Uh, there's, the answer to a lot of the questions is in the book. I, I read the book um, a while back um, and I was absolutely fascinated. It's, it opened my eyes to an awful lot of things that I just didn't, didn't even know about. It's like finding a whole new biological kingdom that you didn't know existed, uh, and just going, how did I, how did I not know about this? You did, you had the same feeling um, when yeah. you were writing it, yes. In slow motion over three years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're coming towards the end of our time now. Is there anything that you want to say um, that uh, about the book or the next book or the process of writing or slime itself that you want to finish up on? Yeah. Just. Uh, I mean even in an hour, an hour is a long time, but it's just impossible uh, 
to really present everything that is interesting and fascinating uh, about slime. So I hope uh, no one is more grossed out now than before, maybe a little less. Uh, and it would be just great if people engaged more because it's, it's such a pity. It's a fascinating substance. It's really sophisticated. We all need it. And it's maybe in danger uh, now, thanks to the uh, climate crisis uh, and stuff like that. So we need more people to focus on that and be aware that it's, that it's here and that it's important. Okay, that's great. So uh, anyone in the audience who wants to make their research career in slime, please do so. It sounds like it's important. Yes. Okay, so unfortunately, we're now out of time. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for talking to us. And I'd, I'd just like to thank you for such a great conversation and for your fascinating, fascinating insights into the world of slime. And, um, and maybe we're not so disgusted by it um, anymore. So thank you very much, Susanna. And if you'd like to buy Susanna's book, uh, Slime and Natural History, I can fully recommend it. Uh, do please go to our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Um, and for details, see the festival uh, website, yorkfestivalofideas.com. And we very much hope you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. And so check out the website for full details of all the events on the festival programme. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these events and continue your conversation using the hashtag #HashYorkIdeas. So thank you again and goodbye.